Good morning, everybody. This is Bo Willette, and you are in the morning Devo with Bo. Oh, it is Tuesday, January 19th. Excited to be with you, as always, just because I need to get in the Word, and I hope you do too, man. It's exciting to learn the Bible, and we are in Romans chapter 9, part 2. If you need the archives, you can always go over there and check them out over there on YouTube. Um, I upload them over there daily for you guys and girls. And I hope that um, we will make it through this wonderful chapter that's just kind of kind of big. It's got a lot of stuff in it. And Paul finally, you know, th this is like so important uh, for Paul. You know, he loves Israel. He loves his people. Good morning. And... And I, I, you know, it just, it's neat to get an insight into, you know, Paul, because, you know, we just got done going over the history of Paul the Apostle in our devos in the book of Acts. And, you know, that was way cool to, to see kind of the background of what Paul went through. And, and remember what his, his kind of format was, if you will, when he went into a town, he would go into where? The synagogue. That's right. He'd find a synagogue and he would go in there and he would teach. And then upon them hearing him share about the Gentiles, that was the trigger word, by the way. And when that word came out, then we have it for sure on three occasions in the book of Acts, this history of the Apostle Paul in, in your New Testament, where, man, they the Jewish people didn't like him uh, when he said that word. And really, I mean, his life literally was on the line. Could you imagine such a hot-button topic that your life is on the line, uh, you know, because of something you shared? And, and the sharing was that, Hey, guess what? Salvation is going to the Gentiles. You know, you have rejected, um, and Jesus says, you resist the work of the Holy Spirit to the Pharisees. You resist it, man. And uh, and I got sheep that are not part of this this uh, this little sheepfold here. And Jesus said, I'm going over there. And um, Jesus' miracles. When you look at them, you see a real foreshadowment, too, of the, the work of the church into Gentile nations because you see him uh, saying, great is your faith to, um, if I remember, one of them was a Roman centurion, and the other one was uh, maybe a woman from Tyre. Uh, and uh, you get the idea that they weren't from the commonwealth of Israel. Or we don't get any idea that they were from the commonwealth of Israel. They were outside of Israel. And and Jesus says, man, great is your faith, and, and I'm going to do a healing um, in your guys' life and for your family. And um, so you see that, that avenue that Jesus takes as well to uh, minister to the non-Jewish people. And, of course, that got Jesus in a lot of trouble. But Paul says, I love you guys. Y you, y you know, I love Israel, and God's got a plan for Israel. And... And even though it says that God has given them a spirit of stupor, right, a numbness, um, it says eyes so that they could not see and ears so that they could not hear to this very day. And no doubt that God solidified their hard heart. Um, you know, I was reading the end of the book of Joshua the other day. When I was reading this passage, it kind of moved me into Joshua 24. And if you read that one, you see kind of this situation where uh, Joshua says to them, hey, are you guys going to obey the covenant that, uh, you know, we I just laid out? And um, he says, as for me and my family, we're going we're gonna to do that. And, of course, Israel says, yeah. And he goes, no, you guys aren't. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting. He says, you guys ain't going to do this. And yet they continue to be like, yep, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. And they have this... Uh, uh, false sense of uh, confidence, if you will, overconfident. <laughs> and we've all been there before, right, where we get a little overconfident. And um, 
and certainly they didn't. They they didn't uphold the law, and they did not enter into a righteousness um, by grace. R- Paul says they were seeking righteousness, a right standing with God, but they were seeking the right standing uh, of God by by works, and. You know, grace is something that's just so utterly awesome, and it's built upon the sovereign work of God. Or else it's no longer grace, right? If it's not a gift from God, from the Creator to you, then it has to do with your ability to be saved, your good works. And as human beings, we like to think that we got it all down. And usually when I look at you know, my wife or my kids, and I look at them in judgment ways, it's usually because I really think that I'm saved by my work. I really do kind of tend to think that I have something on this Christian thing, that I really know how to be a good Christian, or I really have figured it out. I've got this insight into the spiritual world, and um, and yet I don't. <laughs> And yet I am saved by grace. It's a gift. And if I get too cocky, hey, Paul's got some words for us here. So check this out. He focuses on this sovereignty of God in the life of national Israel uh, by saying these words that I've given them a spirit of stupor eyes so that c- they could not see. It's not that Paul's refusing their responsibility. Uh, Paul sees that they have heard the word of God, that the word of God has gone out to them, but they rejected it. They did not uh, put it, they did not accompany that word with faith. They did not trust it. They did not, they did not go, yeah, that's right. And yeah, it's your gift. And when God says in, in to Mos- or through Moses to Israel, hey, I didn't, you guys didn't come to me. I chose you. I went to you and grabbed you. Um, You know, the Gentile nation didn't want uh, me. I go to, I went to you. I raised you up. I made you a nation. Um, And so we're going to see now something really cool. It says, again, I asked, did they stumble as to fall beyond recovery? Paul says, not at all. We kind of went through a little bit of this. He says, rather, because of the transgression, because of their transgressions, the salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. Uh, we kind of all remember that growing up, right? Someone gets this, someone gets the wonderful gift, someone gets the ice cream, and you're like, man, dude, I want an ice cream. And uh, there's that envious. But it says, if their transgression means riches for the world, kind of interesting, right? If their transgression they're moving away, right? They're going outside of the boundaries of what salvation was, meant a turning of the gift towards the Gentile world. Their loss meant riches for the Gentiles, Paul says. How much greater riches were their fullness bring? So again, is Paul saying he's against Israel? Absolutely not, man. He's he's looking forward to the time where there's a What does he say? A fullness of Israel. I am talking to you Gentiles. So now he refers to (coughs) the specific Gentile audience in Rome. I am talking to you Gentiles in as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. If you've ever wanted to know why we say Paul is an apostle to the Gentiles, this is where. This is where it says, I am an apostle to the Gentiles. Now, it doesn't mean that he wasn't to go to Israel. Remember, the call of Paul was to Israel. It says to the Jews, to the Gentiles, and the third was to kings. That's right. So he says, I am talking to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I make my much my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. Isn't that kind of cool? I don't know if you have a, a, a people that you have a real heart for um, and that you really want to see, you want them to be stirred up by, um, you know, by your actions and your ministry. Um, and that can happen, you know, sometimes when you, you know, it can, this can happen in a family, you know, where 
you uh, um, someone rejects the gospel in your family and you turn towards another family member and that family member gets kind of bummed that you're spending so much time with this other family member, but that's because maybe they're receiving the gospel th and that other person gets envious and gets upset. And this is, this is the state, Paul says, of Israel right now, right? But he does it, he says, so he can arouse my own people to envy. They get to arouse them, get them woken up, get them excited about Christ, right? Um, that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. And he says, for if their rejection is reconciliation of the world, what, were, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Woo, that's a powerful one. Right, if their rejection meant salvation to the world, th the gospel goes to the Gentiles and no longer um, national Israel. Right, not just that one focus on national Israel, but God t turning His grace. Right, does God have to be gracious on the world? No. Does He have to be gracious on the Jews? No. Does He have to be gracious on the Gentiles? Absolutely not. God is a righteous judge, and as a righteous judge, God could say guilty. Right, but He doesn't. He pardons sin. Right, He pardons iniquity. Uh, by grace, right? And and um, so he does that to the Gentile world. And then it says, but what is it going to be? What's going to happen when the acceptance of Israel comes in? It says, but life from the dead, literal translation, literally out from dead ones. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Uh, they're out from dead ones. So it can read, for if their rejection is reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but out from dead ones? Literally, uh, wow, um, life from the dead. Uh, you know, I, I loved my little Bible notes in here, and it says a figurative expression describing the conversion of the Jews as a joyful and glorious event like resurrection, which will result in even greater blessings for the world and there is a whole sections or ho there is whole sections of the scripture that speak about this time called the millennial kingdom where people will go to israel and you know you read that uh, in the book of ezekiel you read about this millennial temple that's uh constructed and there's the um really interesting uh just differences within that temple and um the workers within the temple as well and their roles. Um, and uh, the, the Bible speaks of nations coming to Israel and, and gathering and, and worshiping God. And, and there's this wonderful unity, if you will. And uh, so kind of neat, right? But you can see the power play that Paul's saying, hey, dude, you think, you think God reaching the Gentiles is all that, man? You just wait till the Jews, it says in Zechariah, when they see uh, the one they have pierced and they mourn and they cry out and they realize, man, that, it, man, we pierced the Messiah. Wow, what a trip. So, you know, what are we praying for, man? We're praying for that moment, too, that turning of Israel. If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, right? You guys know what first fruits is, the kind of the wheat harvest, the barley harvest. Grab the first fruits of it, give it to the Lord. This is where the idea of first fruits of tithing comes in. You know, you get your check, you tithe the first fruits, you know, and the first fruits always held the promise of future uh, prosperity. And that's that's where we get that idea of, hey, we give at the beginning and and, you know, we're we're looking forward to the promise of God to um, fulfill um, our lives. And um, so we give them the first fruits of everything kind of idea. And that's very uh, something that was established in the Torah. And so Paul utilizes this language and he says, if the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy and so are the branches. So Paul's really now starting to hone in on this. Like God's not done with these people. You know, they got to they got the roots good. He says the first fruits is there. You know, they had a lot of good stuff going on. They had people that trusted the Lord. They weren't perfect. I mean, they're not even close to perfect, right? These guys were a mess in a lot of ways, but they were 
they were accredited righteousness by faith. What did they do? They trust in the work of God. And uh, they trusted in his ability to save. So if some of the branches have been broken off, talking about Israel here, and you, though uh, a wild olive shoot, how many of you guys are wild olive shoots this morning? You feel kind of wild olive shoot, right? You're all over the place. And uh, that's how some of our Christianity is, is we're all over the place. We're like up and down. We're like, wow, the, you know, the spirit, I feel great and I don't feel great. You know, this is weird. This is weird. That, I, this feels that way. This feels this way. You know, that kind of thing. And we feel like wild, wild uh, uh, olive shoots. That's for sure. Instead of just realizing that you're saved by grace, man. Um, you know, I go into every place and I just kind of go, man, you know, I'm saved by grace. And it's a good day um, today. Um, you know, that that's, that's kind of the root. That's kind of the foundation uh, of the stability. Um, but at times we can feel super wild olive shoot. And I can too. And it says... Though you being a wild olive shoot, having been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not boast over those branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. So, man, I'm a part of it. So, man, that's awesome. I'm so good. I got everything going well. I really know how to, I, I'm really, uh, I should be saved because I deserve it because I'm such a good person. I do everything really well. And uh, you start thinking that, man, you guys are better than others. You're superior than other people. You really know what you're doing. And, um, what does Paul say? Granted, sure, you were grafted in, you know, but remember, he says, granted, but you were broken off because of unbelief. S they were broken off because of unbelief. S you stand by faith. So they were broken off because of their unbelief. You, you're, you're rooted in by faith. That's it. You're just trusting in him. That's what you're doing. So don't get all like in, you know sassy into your all your goodness. It says, "Do not be arrogant, but be afraid." Man, now Paul sees a couple things about the character of God here. That when we understand the sovereignty of God, there's a couple things that go on. There's a humbleness that goes on in our heart. So when we realize we're saved by grace, then there's no longer the superiority idea or self-righteousness because we realize we're saved by grace and we're all in the same boat. So we're no longer arrogant, but when we understand that we're held into the root by faith, then we have also a reverence for God because we realize God's sovereignty in election. That God can harden whom he hardens and he can soften whom he softens as the creator. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. How about you Gentiles? Maybe God won't spare you either. God is sovereign. And uh, man, that's true. Now, people who go, man, I don't like that. You know, I don't think that's just with God. Again, my question to anybody is, well, then what do you think? Who do you think um, is just on this planet? You know, do you have, uh, are you the just one? Or do you have justice down? Are you saying that you really, in yourself, in your autonomy, that you are just in all your situations, that you know how to implement perfect justice? See, God says he's righteous and he can implement perfect justice. Um, either you're going to trust that or you're going to trust that God has the upper hand on justice and you'll argue with God. And you can argue with God till, you, till the cows come home. I certainly have at times. and uh, But it don't work, by the way. Um, it just don't work. So it says, consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God, right? There's a kindness of God to put us into the root. And then there's a sternness of God, right, that humbles us and makes us, or puts us, or makes us uh, reverent towards God and go, wow, dude, uh, you know, I got to realize that God is a judge as well, and he is sovereign. And that sovereignty, again, 
brings up these different ideas and it balances me as a person realizing I'm saved by grace, but yet I also wa- need to reverence God because God is the righteous judge. And so consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness, the character qualities of God, right? Through this teaching on sovereignty, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off, you Gentiles, right? So he's speaking to the Gentiles. <laughs> you guys can't get all go- all cocky. And it says, and if they do not persist, uh, and if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Oh man! So the sovereignty of God is not just like they're out and that's it. See, the Gentiles were out before, and now they're in. So the Jews maybe are out now. But guess what? There's a remnant now, and hey, maybe all, all uh, the nation of Israel will be back in again. It says, after all, if you were cut out, out of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature, were grafted into a cultivated olive tree. Now, Paul's getting us, uh, giving us a little botany, I guess. I'm not a botanist or know much about growing trees. But I guess Paul's point is that, hey, it's not normal to have a wild olive tree grafted into the natural cultivated olive tree. It's the opposite's normal, the cultivated olive tree to be grafted into the wild tree, but not the other way around. So he says, you know what, right now things are a little weird, you know, right now things are going a little backwards. You know, and it's kind of neat that Paul says that, I think, after all, because it feels a little backwards, don't it? (laughs) If there's anything we've learned over the last years, things seem a little odd. It says, uh, how much more readily will these, you know, uh, the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? So how much more natural is it for the natural olive tree branches to be grafted into the, the root? the natural olive tree root. And that is, he's talking about Jews, the Jewish people being grafted right back in. So that is super normal. And so we should, you know, as a Gentile people, uh, people of non-Jewish, the non-Jewish nation, we should be super blessed to be a part of the root uh, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, uh, we shouldn't get this mentality that God is done with Israel. Uh, God is finished with them as a nation. He has a purpose and a plan. And his sovereignty, in his sovereignty, he's going to um, uh, bear out that plan. Um, it says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. So you can see the the pull of Paul, right? The conceit. You know, Paul saw a lot of religious conceit in his day. He saw Jewish people be conceited. He saw Gentile people be conceited. He saw a lot of tug of war, obviously, in this way. And he says, uh, you know, you need to understand this teaching so that you don't become conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part. So Paul says, in part, until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. Wow, what a cool passage. There is a fullness of the Gentiles that will come in. And then it is written, and then Paul quotes from what book? What's one of his favorite books that he's quoting from? Well, this quote, let's find out. This is from, I'm pretty sure I know, but, you know, just to be on the safe side, Isaiah. He's, He's in Isaiah. It says... The deliverer will come from Zion, Jerusalem. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. Okay, he's going to turn Israel. All right, Jacob became Israel in the Bible. And he's going to turn godlessness away from that nation. And this is my covenant with them. I will take away their sins. So God will be there for them, uh, take away their sins as a nation, and... Uh, there's going to be deliverance for the nation. And so in that interesting, in part, it says Israel received a hardening and that the time of the Gentiles will come in. You get the idea that it's the number of the Gentiles that has come in. 
Gentile believers that come to faith in Jesus Christ, you might be one of them. Man, wow, what a blessing. And uh, and then it says, and so then Israel will be saved. So in prophecy, we really look to the time of the Gentiles being fulfilled. And then all of a sudden, God's timeline kicks back in to the nation of Israel. Really what we call Daniel's 70, uh, 70th week. Um, and that's from Daniel chapter 9. And you might want to read that prophecy after the wonderful confession of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 to check it out. Don't get conceited, right? Whoa, what a good Devo, uh, you know, to think about. Don't get conceited, right? Don't think you're all that. As far as the gospel is concerned, Israel is enemies on your account, but as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs, right? The root is holy, the calling of God, the sovereign calling of God on Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable, right? God has called them. He's promised. Uh, he's made a covenant with them, and it's not going to be taken away. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy, and as a result, their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. <laughs> That's awesome. For God has bound all over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Wow, I love that all part. That's pretty awesome. There's a lot of all there, right? Uh, God's going to have mercy on all. Uh, and that's exciting to know. Um, and I love that idea that, um, you know, God uh, just speaks to Israel, he doesn't give up on Israel. He still ha loves them, still has a plan for them. Though they've hardened their heart, though they killed the, uh, uh, there's a crucifixion uh, of Jesus that uh, uh, they were a part of. Um, and yet, you know, God has a, a plan for them. And, and I hope you just keep seeing that, that, um, you know, he's got a plan for people. You have to trust God with people's lives. And, you know, you can put people in the hands of God. And what God, what Paul's saying is that, you know what? You know, God, that's a, the best place to put it at. Everything's safe with the Lord. Nothing's safe if you don't give it to God. That's what A.W. Tozer said. Um, you know, yeah, nothing's safe. I mean, then it's all on you, man. You got to control everything. You got to manipulate everything to get everybody to do what you want them to do. And uh, that's how it works. But that's not it. God's sovereign. He's the righteous judge. He's the one who can be uh, do the right things at the right time. And we need to trust him in it. Uh, so Paul sees something radical in all this. And he just says, oh, the depth and riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments. Right. You might try to think m more through these this wonderful passage, these passages of Paul. But how unsearchable are his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out? Uh, wow, God is uh, above and beyond. Who has known the mind of the Lord? The answer is nobody. Or who has been his counselor? Can you counsel God? A lot of people try. Right. Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? Do you think God owes you something? Is that what it is? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. You could see the problem with us as human beings in that doxology at the end, right? Because we just have pride. We think we could counsel God. We think we deserve something from God. We think we know the mind of the Lord, right? And, you know, all that we really think we got all that stuff down. And, um, you know, there needs to be a, uh, the, the teaching of sovereignty should move us to a place of, definitely a reverence and a humility um, in our life and thankfulness by the way uh, to ab absolutely be thankful so it's a long devo to get through that chapter but it's certainly a cool one man uh, that's for sure so hey let's not be conceited right let's not think of ourselves highly in that way but let us remember that we are saved by grace through faith be thankful so you guys have a great day okay take care